Hello. I think, I think I have never had such a wonderful introduction before. It's the coolest thing I've seen. So um, I'll try to, to live up to it. Uh, my name is Lisa Arlet. As it was already told, I'm a professor in experimental biophysics in the X-ray and neutron science group at Niels Bohr Institute. What I'll talk about today is neutrons, X-rays, and shooting the unseeable biology. So, as it was already told in the introduction, we are, we are building up this super duper duper microscope in Sweden right now. It's actually two microscopes, and here are some houses, and here's the city of Lund and Malmö, so they're quite big. It's a European spallation source, which is a big neutron scattering facility, and then right next to it we have a beautiful round building, which is a synchrotron, an X-ray synchrotron, so that's the Max 4 synchrotron that we are building up. And uh, with these two facilities, we'll be able to look into many, many different tiny, tiny things. But uh, the tiny things that I'm most interested in looking into are uh, illustrated here. So this is a little, imagine that you could take a bit of your cell membrane and then cut it up in a little square like I've done here. Then you would see they would not be red because they wouldn't have color on this length scale, but you would see some molecules that with this lipid bilayer here, they would have a little head group and some hydrocarbon chains, some oily chains. And, and that's actually what keeps yourself, yourself together. And then in this bilayer membrane here, you have all these proteins here, the green ones here. They are also not green in real life. They actually also don't have a color, but, uh, but uh, we have painted them green here. And, uh, and these are the molecules that make sure that all the different molecules, that they can get in and out of the cell, and that's really important because um, all of us here, we are like many cell organisms and we really appreciate that our cells are able to communicate with each other. And in order for the cells to be able to communicate with each other, then you need these membrane proteins. So they would be right uh, quite nice to understand. I'll actually start a totally different place because Niels Bohr Institute, you probably all know Niels Bohr Institute for Theoretical Physics. But we actually have a long and proud tradition for, for biophysics. And my personal hero here, this is this beautiful guy here, Georges de Hevesy. He was a, a Hungarian radio chemist. And a radio chemist, that's not a chemist that tried to make radios, but it's a chemist that, uh, that investigates radioactivity. And there, were, there are not so many radio chemists any longer. But uh, between 1900 and 1940, that was just the coolest thing to be, because that was when we had this radioactivity hype, and we tried, or the scientists then, they tried to investigate and develop radioactivity for all of those sorts of different purposes. This culminated with the development of the nuclear bomb uh, at the Second World War, and that uh, created some afterthoughts among many of the scientists. And uh, so they tried to develop more peaceful applications of radioactivity. And one of them is nuclear power plants that some like, some don't like so much. Uh, but, uh, but then also Hevesy, he was also one of the peaceful radio chemists. And he, um, first of all, he was the co-discoverer of element number 72, which, which he chose to call hafnium after Copenhagen. Uh, but what was really important of his work was actually that he decided that it could be interested if he, interesting if he tried to water plants with radioactive substances. Because, <laughs> I mean, who would think of that? But, uh, but then, the radio, then the plants would suck up these substances and then you could put a, a film, photographic film on top of the plants and then you could see where different molecules, for example, phosphate or nitrate and so on, where do they go and plant, how fast and what happens at all. And, and this actually gave him the Nobel Prize for his work on the use of isotopes and radioactive isotopes mostly as tracers in the study of chemical uh, processes. So as such, he was actually the first biophysicist at Niels Bohr Institute. Uh, we that do biophysics at Niels Bohr Institute today, we don't do so much radiochemistry and radioactive tracers any longer, because uh, that we did many years ago, and then we gave it on to the medical doctors and the biologists to apply, and now we want to do other things. And one of the, one of the big things that, that we are excited about these years, not only the biophysicists, but many of the physicists, this is this fantastic big equipment that we are building up in Lund, uh, only one hour away from here. So there's actually two bits, as I said, it's a European spallation source, which is a neutron source, 
and I decided to put all the zeros on the price tag here today. It's expensive, so, but if you compare it to some of the airplanes that the military wants to buy now and so on, it's, it's almost cheap. So, <laughs> um, and I think, I think we are many that will benefit more, maybe more positively from this facility than they'll benefit from the fighter planes. So I think it's, yeah, so I think it's fine to, to have this as well. Uh, then right next to it, the Swedish government decided that was slightly before the crisis had really set in, so they decided that they would uh, top up and they also build an X-ray synchrotron, so a really powerful X-ray source next to it. And uh, with the combination of these two facilities, you can see that they're not really there yet. Max 4 synchrotron will have its first light on midsummer in 2016, so that's actually quite soon. And the Swedes are very poetic, so of course it has to be on midsummer, then they turn on the light and so on. <laughs> Uh, the European uh, spallation source, I think they are happy if they have uh, neutrons in plural in 2019. It's really a much harder job to produce neutrons than it is to produce x-rays. But we are working very, very hard on it. And when we get these facilities up and running in not so many years, then we'll have the world's best facility for neutron and x-ray based structural investigations on sub-nanometer scale. That was a very long sentence, but it means that we can look into tiny, tiny, tiny details of all sorts of materials and substances with this super duper microscope here, and that's really nice. So the questions that uh, I will address today are the following. So first, as many of you probably have heard about X-ray investigations of all sorts of things, so you know that X-rays, they may be fine to look into materials, but why on earth do we also want to look into materials with neutrons? Why do we get such a crazy idea? Um, in particular, if you know that neutrons, they actually, if you take neutrons, they live a nice and long life within the nuclei of the atoms, and they're very stable there, but if you pull them out of the nuclei, then they don't feel so well. Then they decay radioactive, uh, radioactively within five to ten minutes, so, so they're really a bit troublesome to work with, and you also have to dig them out of the nuclear cores, and that not, that's not so easy. Um, and then also, if we want to look at something that is that small, then why do we need so big and, and also expensive equipment to see something that small? What is it really that we can see and how? And then why care about biological molecules, what they look like and how they work? Why care about that at all? I've actually decided to start with the end. Uh, I'll start with this part, part here, and then I will somehow work my way up here during the presentation here. Because I'll start with uh, not really biological molecules, but with medicine molecules. And, uh, and if you talk to some of the pharmacists and so on, then uh, they basically talk about two different types of medical molecules. They have what they call small molecule-based drugs, and uh, they are not very creative because a small molecule-based drug is basically a drug that is based on a small molecule. It's just not so many atoms that has been put together into a small molecule. There's a good example here of, uh, of uh, acetyl salicyl acid, which is the active substance in, in aspirin or etotyl, etc. And uh, this is actually a molecule that has been known in uh, popular uh, medicine for hundreds of years. This is the extract uh, of, of the bark from a willow tree, and it has been known for centuries that if you could extract this, then it would have like a nice uh, sedating effect on you. Uh, by now, it's, uh, I think you can still extract it, of course, but it's much more econo econo economical efficient to synthesize it chemically, so that's what big uh, chemical companies like Bayer, for example, does. Then on the other hand, we have a, a more modern type of medical drug here, and uh, this is the protein-based drugs, and again, a protein-based drug is a drug molecule that is based on a protein. Not very difficult, and uh, the very good example of this, such a molecule, is insulin, which is crucial in the treatment of diabetes. And, uh, and insulin is a much larger molecule than this one. I've not bothered to draw all the single atoms of it like I could over here. Instead, I have a whole chain of amino acids that are attached to each other here, and uh, they fold up in a, in a fantastic three-dimensional structure here. This here is actually not only one insulin molecule, but it's six insulin molecules, so it's a so-called insulin hexamere that is coordinated, that 
organize himself around some cent uh, central uh, uh, zinc molecules. When it was discovered that you could start to treat diabetic patients with insulin, that, that people that had diabetes actually lacked insulin and not just something else, then they decided, uh, in the beginning, they extracted this insulin from dogs or pigs, and uh, that was, of course, feasible because we are more willing to sacrifice these animals than, than, than humans, of course, <laughs> in order to extract insulin, but it took quite a lot of animals to save uh, the di poor diabetic patients. So, so uh, around Second World War and after Second World War, it was found out how insulin could be produced uh, f from different other sources, and today it's produced by GMO-modified yeast, and that is really much more, much nicer than killing a whole lot of uh, dogs and <laughs> pigs in order to produce this. So, but how do, do these molecules actually work, really? And, uh, and this is what I'll try to, to explain here. So the small molecule drug that I started with, aspirin, it's a molecule that suppresses some enzymes, and the enzymes are really the molecular factories in our body. So enzymes are proteins that we have in our body, and they produce other little molecules. And if you take some aspirin, then this will suppress these COX enzymes. So they will stop producing so many molecules. And uh, that will mean that they'll produce fewer of these signal signaling hormones that we need when we feel bad, but they will actually suppress signals about pain and a lot of other things. So this can actually be very nice. So if you feel a little bit of pain and so on, then it's, or if you just want to have your signals suppressed in other ways, then it's actually nice to take an aspirin. <laughs> then, uh, then you'll have less information from your whole city and that can, my whole body, and that can sometimes be nice. Uh, with, uh, with insulin, it's a signaling hormone. So this is actually one of those molecules up here that could be produced from the COX enzymes here, but it's a signaling hormone and it actually starts a whole cascade. So uh, it starts uh, the glucose transport into our cells. I'll, I'll explain that more elaborately in a little while. And this makes sure that the cells, they receive the fuel that they need in order to convert these molecules ADP to ATP. And, uh, when, and the ATP is essential because that's the essential fuel for, for cells. So in order for cells to do all the jobs they have to do, they need some energy. And, and this is really this ATP that they rely on. And if, uh, if the insulin doesn't, if there's no insulin, then this cascade doesn't work. So this is 100% essential for life that, that you get, get this cascade going. So this is a very specific, in contrast to aspirin, it's a very specific interaction that we have here. And then I have a third type here, uh, Paclisaxel, which is a cytotoxin in Danish, a cell gift. And also the chemists or the pharmacists, they're actually not so, I mean, you think that they would be geniuses, but they also, they go and take off bark from different trees and they, they do extracts and plants and so on. And then they test, see whether it works and how it works and so on. And, uh, and, and Paclisaxel, which is a cytotoxin that is used extensively in cancer treatment, it's, it's one of those such molecules here. So it's extract from bark of U, which is called tax in Danish, and it kills uh, cancer cells, and unfortunately it also kills other, all other quickly growing cells, so that means that the molecule is very, very unspecific when it works. So on one hand we have the protein-based drugs, which are, I think uh, will be the future of the drugs, because they are really specific, they can go in and resolve a specific function, and then we have these uh, small molecule drugs like aspirin and, and Paclitaxel and so on, which are very unspecific, but very cheap to produce uh, drugs. But how do the mo medical molecules actually work? So now I told you how they feel and a little bit about the enzymes and how they dampen and all that. How do they really work? And in order to understand that, we have to first zoom in. And uh, here's a, a picture of a, a typical mammal cell, so a cell from that could be from one of you, maybe, not probably not, but, but a typical cell here with a, a cell core in here. Uh, and uh, the insulin receptor, it sits out on the outer plasmid membrane up here. So this such a cell here, it's about five micrometers. So it's something that you can actually see in a microscope. Uh, then these, these uh, insulin molecules here, they sit out in the outer cell membrane here. And when we look at how insulin works, then first the insulin molecule comes and binds to this receptor. This receptor is a membrane protein. So one of the guys that I told you in the beginning that I really like because they are so important. Uh, insulin goes down and binds here. 
then this one somehow changes conformation down here, such that a whole signal cascade is started, such that some little depots of, of uh, glucose transporters that are near the surface here, they somehow get the information that they should go up to the surface, merge with the surface, unfold up here, and then open up for the glucose transport into the cell. This is actually quite fantastic that uh, little insulin can, can take care of all this. But if we look at the length scales that are involved with this, uh, then the thickness of this cell membrane here, it's only about five nanometers. So that is five to times 10 to the minus ninth meters or one one meter divided by one billion, it's, it's not a lot. Uh, it's a very, very short uh, distance here. So, uh, so the good question to ask is, how do we know all this? When I make such a drawing here, then how do I know? Because it's clearly not something that, that we can see. And, and how do we know what the molecules look like at all? Um, and, uh, and this is actually... So now we are at Christiania, and I think it's suitable now that I take you to a very special place. And uh, this place is called reciprocal space, and it's, uh, <laughs> it's not like any other spaces that you have been to, I think, I hope. So reciprocal space is a place where long distances become converted into something very short, and, and short distances become converted into something very long, and then try to imagine what happens in there. It's, I think if you, are, if you are a physicist doing X-ray and neutron scattering, then you think reciprocal space is a quite cool place to, to be. And uh, as one of my, uh, one of my former, PhD, former PhD students once said that, ah, reciprocal space, that's actually the place where all physicists would like to go when they die. That could be <laughs> really nice. So, uh, and then I hired him straight after because I think that that was... <laughs> So cool. <laughs> so, but, uh, but reciprocal space, that's actually something we need in order to find out how these very, very tiny things look like. And we can get to reciprocal space by shining either X-rays or neutrons into, into very small molecules. Here there's a very nice picture and very famous picture also. This is the first X-ray diffraction pattern that was really used for, for obtaining big insight into to science. This is the X-ray diffraction pattern that was obtained by Rosalind Franklin in the 50s of the DNA structure. Uh, this picture was then used to determine, to calculate ba backwards from these beautiful pictures here where you have all the large distances about the DNA. They will be placed close to the middle here, while all the short information, they will go out here to, towards the sides here. Uh, Watson and Crick, from this picture, they could actually find out what the DNA structure looked like and, and gave us this uh, superhelix model here that, uh, that we now, uh, is, is now quite important. It's, at least it's quite important that we know how it looks like because then we can much better <laughs> understand how it works. So um, Watson and Crick received the Nobel Prize for this and Rosalind Franklin, which was a woman and in the 50s and so on, I think. No, she'd say, it's the, I'm just taking this picture, this was nothing. So, so she didn't receive any prizes for that. But I think she would have received that today, and she has received lots of the honor afterwards. But in order to obtain such a picture here, you have to have a crystal of the DNA. So this superhelix structure here, you have to crystallize it somehow. And uh, this is, of course, a tremendous task. They, you can crystallize salt or sugar and so on, but imagine that you had to crystallize a big floppy molecule. That is somewhat harder to, to imagine, it, but, but this can actually be done. And, uh, and if you obtain such a crystal of, for example, DNA or a protein, then you can take this crystalline solid, then you can take an X-ray tube, and then you can t turn it on. And then if you place, like, here's a LED screen that is placed after the X-ray tube, where you drill a tiny hole in it so that you get a very well-focused X-ray beam out. Then the X-ray beam comes out, it interacts with the crystal structure here, and then you get this nice diffraction pattern out. And here we are in reciprocal space, so you can see this is really, really beautiful. Nice spots, and they sit in a symmetric pattern. And from this beautiful symmetric pattern here, you can calculate backwards and find out what the crystal looks like. And this is actually how we obtain this insight, and there are no other ways of looking into so small structures than 
by sending x-rays into it and then going a tour in reciprocal space and then hopefully coming back to real space and find out what the molecules look like. So the big advantage of uh, x-ray crystallography, which is really the main technique in the field, uh, is that it has a structural resolution down to one angstrom. So this means that we can get atomic resolution. We can see where the single atoms sit in the molecules. And that's really, that's, that's quite something. Uh, the big disadvantage is that it requires that you can crystallize your molecule. And uh, most of the really interesting biological molecules, they are sort of uh, not very quiet and they don't li want to lie down in a big crystal with, you know, 10 to the 15 other molecules and stack up with them in a totally uh, coherent way. They actually like to move much more and you need some other techniques to investigate those molecules. And uh, alternative techniques, there are several alternative techniques. My technique here, which I of course uh, favor because I think it's the coolest technique, and, uh, <laughs> but, it's, uh, but there are many techniques, and this is called small angle scattering. And uh, like in crystallography, you take a beam, this can be a neutron beam, and then the technique is called small angle neutron scattering, which is abbreviated SANS, or it can be an X-ray beam, and then it's called small angle X-ray scattering, SACS, but then you take a vial or, of your sample, and here you, like, you can see that I have taken some worm-like particles that just swim around and so on, and I just put them into the beam, and then I obtain a beautiful scattering pattern in reciprocal space over here. So this is uh, quite nice, I think. As you maybe remember from, four, from before, if you had a crystal that you put into here, to here, you would obtain some nice dots. I don't obtain those nice dots in my pictures, unfortunately. I obtain some rings, which can also be nice, but they don't contain as much information. But, uh, but the good thing is that then I don't have to crystallize my sample, so I can just put anything into my sample. So some years ago, I took a piece of a car tire that I just put in there, obtained beautiful scattering patterns, and you could actually see what a car tire material looks like down to a nanometer scale. If you're a car tire producer, then that's interesting. So, <laughs> so the big advantage of small angle scattering is that you can measure all samples, you can just put anything into the beam. The disadvantage is then, because you have all this flexibility in the sample and they don't do the same movements at the same time, then you can only go down to about one nanometer or 10 angstroms. This is still quite small, but it's not atomic structure, so, so we can see tiny things, but not tiny, tiny things with this technique here. Then I already told you, but I'll, I'll explain it again here, this uh, travel to reciprocal space, because if, you have, if I have an insulin molecule and then I Fourier transform it or I do a scattering experiment on it, then I'll obtain this scattering pattern where all the information in this picture over here, so all the information about the large distances and the insulin, so for example, how, what the diameter is, that will be, that I will find in the inner part of the curve here, because large things become small. Uh, but then all the tiny details about the distance from the coils here and so on, that'll be, that'll be available out in the outer rims of this picture. So I have to get my head tuned into thinking everything a little bit upside down. But when I do that, then I can actually find out what this molecule looks like from, from, uh, from this picture over here. And uh, if I all, here I have actually drawn a molecule that I know what looks like, so that's not so interesting because why on earth all the trouble? But in many cases we don't know what the molecules look like, and then it's really important that, that we have a technique to looking into it. Then I already mentioned the word Fourier transform, and this is also something that we as physicists are quite happy with. I mean, not that it's called a Fourier transform, but we are happy that we know how the two are related to each other. So we can actually calculate, if we know what this one looks like, then we can also calculate what this one should look like, more or less, and sometimes we can even go the other way back, and that's, uh, that's really good. So many of the old crystallography pictures, they have been taken by X-rays, but uh, I also mentioned that we are building up European spallation source, which is a neutron source, and uh, I told you that, and you already know that, I guess also, that neutrons, they are particles that sit in the nuclei of, of, of the atoms. Um, and how, 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 how on earth can we take some particles and then obtain diffraction patterns? Because diffraction patterns 
you're probably used to thinking about that has something to do with light and light waves, something more continuous and so on. So, um, and here is actually another question that they discussed a lot at the Niels Bohr Institute and in the rest of, uh, in the, rest of the world in the first half of the last century, and that is uh, the particle wave duality, that particles, they can both be particle-like and they can be wave-like, so they can have both types of behavior. Um, so neutrons, they are particles, but if I take a whole neutron beam and send it off with a certain uh, velocity, then it will actually behave like a wave. And it turns out that we can even relate the two. We can relate the velocity of the neutrons to the wavelength of this wave, which I have called a lambda here. So if I have a neutron of a certain velocity, v, uh, then I can calculate it simply from this equation here, where h is Planck's constant, which has a, I mean, it always turns up in all physics equations. We almost always have something with Planck's constant. So this is also present here. And then m here, this is the mass of the neutron, um, just the rest mass. And then, and then you can relate the two. So you can easily relate these two to each other. So the neutrons, they are a little bit, a little bit, you know, like, like those uh, sensitive men that were modern a few years ago, which, you know, didn't really know whether they want to be macho or didn't really know whether they want to be, you know, more feminine and in touch with their emotions and so on. And with the, with the neutrons, it's a little bit the same. They actually don't really know whether they want to be a particle or a wave. And if we have to, you know, if we as physicists have to manipulate these neutrons, then we have to treat them with care. And when they want to be treated like waves, then we have to do that. If they want to be treated as particles, then we have to do that. And they don't really tell, and we just have to. But uh, so, uh, so it's a little bit troublesome. <laughs> but but, um, but uh, you know, we like them, and we like them just the way they are. They, they, they also help us <laughs> in many ways. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, it's, so it's good to have them. Um, so, uh, but unfortunately, they are very difficult to produce. Um, so, how do we, how do we, how do we generate a whole beam of neutrons? Well, the normal way is that you you build a nuclear reactor, and uh, and and that is uh, like a big equipment. We have a few nuclear power plants in Sweden. One we can see from from Denmark, and we don't have any any longer in Denmark. But it, so it's big equipment because you need to run. A, controlled fission process in order to produce neutrons. You have to drill them out of the cores. So you have these uh, uranium-235, and you can excite it. If you already have one neutron, you can excite it to uranium-236, which is unstable, and then it falls apart, generates three new neutrons, which can then enter again, and then you can produce more and more. If you don't control this, then you have a nuclear bomb. If you control it, then you have a nice energy-producing nuclear power plant, and of course, uh, there's a risk uh, <laughs> associated because it's so close to the to the bomb as well. So in in Sweden, um, and when we, we when we started to work for the for European spallation source, it was already so the politicians and the society was already not so happy with the nuclear power plants and nuclear energy and so on. So we decided that we had to produce these neutrons at the European spallation source in a, in a more, okay, I mean, I would not call it envir envir environmentally friendly way, but in a more, in a, in a less dangerous way. And this is why we decided to, to aim for the spallation process. And in this spallation process, you take a heavy uh, metal target, uh, and then you bombard it with uh, protons, and then you excite these target molecules here, and then they basically start to sweat off the neutrons, then the neutrons will fall off, and then you can harvest the neutrons from, from, uh, from this target here. ESS is placed based on this spallation process, at, and at ESS that we're building up in Sweden right now, it's the protons from a 300 meter long, five uh, megawatt uh, linear accelerator, and those protons, we bombard them into a rotating tungsten target that is a couple of meters in diameter. So we have this big disk of tungsten, uh, which, which then is rotated, and then we, uh, then we shoot these protons into it, and then there's a lot of neutrons generated that, that we harvest. And, um, and uh, spallation, that's actually not really a good Danish word for it. I think the closest thing 
I could come to was would be in Danish when you talk about something where you say you at 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 man slår flint and all, and this is actually also what we what we in a way do here that we uh, we slår flint uh, neutron flinter uh, of these cores here. So I think if we should find a good Danish name for for European spallation source. It should be the European flintekilde eller den europæiske flintekilde. Um, uh, jeg ved ikke om det lyder ikke særlig high tech, så måske passer det meget godt med tiden og sådan noget. Um, og så kan vi jo altid gemme alt det her fantastiske oppe bag, bag navnet her. Now I change into Danish and I'll swap back to to uh, to English. So. So I told you that the neutrons, they are hard to manipulate and we have to, you know, treat them with care and so on. They are also not so easy to produce. Uh, either a fission reactor or a spallation source, which is both quite expensive and, and big. So why on earth, when, when we can do all these wonderful things with X-rays, why on earth going through all the trouble of producing the neutrons? And uh, to illustrate this, I've taken This uh, drawing here, so we don't actually know whether it's so big and, and whether it really looks like this, but this is what I imagine it looks like. And uh, I have a membrane protein that sits in a cell membrane. If I look at that with x-rays, then I would get a nice structure out where I would see both the membrane protein and the, the head groups of this lipid bilayer here and the tail groups, and they would have different contrasts. It looks nice when I look at it in direct space, but when, when I look at it in reciprocal space, it unfortunately looks less nice. It's, it's actually difficult to interpret that picture. The, the huge advantage of neutrons is that we can play with the contrast and we can change the contrast as we go along. So if I just take the same system and instead of normally H2O-based solvent, then I use D2O-based solvent, then I will have this uh, membrane protein here, and then I will have only a two-color system because I'll not see the difference between the heads and the tails here. This sounds like I'm getting less information now, but maybe I'm zooming in on some of the inf exciting information, and that can be really helpful. Then I can play another trick, because I can actually go ahead and, and deuterate the membrane here. I've still drawn it here, but you can actually turn down the signal from this membrane so much that you only see the membrane protein. So then you have a really nice picture of, if you want to investigate the membrane protein, then it's nice to see this and not all the blur and membrane around it. Then there are a lot of people that actually think that uh, much of the secret of these uh, membrane protein that actually also lies in the surroundings and the membranes that surround them. So here with the neutrons, you can go to a third contrast situation where if you mix uh, H2O and D2O, then you can actually mix it in such a way that the protein here becomes invisible. And then suddenly you can only see the membrane here. And this is really the cool, cool thing about neutrons, that you can change contrast, play with the contrast systematically. And with x-rays, we have lots of x-rays, so that's really nice, but we cannot, we cannot control their contrast in any way. So, so that's why we bother uh, to, to work with those uh, complicated neutrons anyway. So if you do neutron and x-ray scattering, you rely on, on these big facilities. We don't have a nuclear power plant at the University of Copenhagen. I'm almost laughing because it's totally ridiculous to think about that we would have a nuclear power plant in, in Denmark by now. Uh, we, we also don't, we have a small synchrotron in Aarhus, but that doesn't produce x-rays with the right energies. So actually the place that, that my group likes to go to is, is Grenoble in France. Uh, where, which lies in a nice valley, and at, uh, in this valley you have this Institut Lau Langevin, which is, uh, in this container here, there's a nuclear reactor, and uh, so here there are a lot of neutrons are produced there in the nuclear, in the core of this reactor, and then they have uh, holes and drill holes into the reactor, and then they can harvest neutrons from all sides and use them for experiments. Right next to it we have the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility, which is this big ring here where we can use to generate x-rays and then we have a lot of, then we also harvest these x-rays and use them for a lot of different types of experiments. Uh, there are several excellent facilities, different places in Europe. There are not so many neutron facilities, but there are actually several really, really good x-ray facilities, uh, different places. So we also use the other ones, but Grenoble, I think, is the, is the favorite spot right now. Um, So these are large-scale facilities. They're, of course, really expensive. So if you want to do experiments there, then you really have to 
use the time with care because it's precious. So as scientists, we compete for beam time, as we call it, at these facilities. So we submit an application, explain what we would like to do. And then if we are lucky, we get 24 hours of beam time. And uh, then uh, as I've, uh, there's this photo here where we actually went a lot, large team there. We had 24 hours of neutrons first and then 24 hours of x-rays afterwards. So 40 hours, 48 hours in a row. And uh, then we had to be a quite large team in order to exploit that optimally. But it normally goes quite well. This photo is taken after the session. <laughs> People are still sort of smiling and, uh, <laughs> and eating, and I think they, most of them went to, to bed right after. It was quite tough, but it's a fun way of working, I think. And uh, it's really almost like going on an expedition, except, except that we go and we have all the samples from home, and then we go and harvest all data. So it's slightly different, but uh, I think it's fun. So now I'll be four slides of science, and it'll uh, uh, real science. So the reason. The, the big advantage of small angle scattering is that we can actually predict what our data look like. So if I had a test tube of little spherical particles of 60 angstroms, then I can calculate that my small angle scattering data would look exactly like this. That's really nice. Uh, if I had rod-like particles, the scattering pattern would look like this. If I had worm-like particles as over here, it would look somewhat like this. If you are trained in looking at reciprocal space pictures, then you think that these pictures look dramatically different from each other. It's very easy to see the difference. If you're not so trained in looking at those pictures, it just looks like you know decaying curve with oscillations and so on. But, uh, but this is actually quite nice. Um, the big problem with small angle scattering is then that, I mean, it's also illustrated here, what we go and, and harvest when we do an experiment is that we, we get a scattering pattern that in two dimensions looks like something like this. Beautiful. Uh, we would love to be able to, to press a button and then uh, have a computer doing some calculations for us and then hopefully find out that our molecules look like this. Unfortunately, we cannot do that with, uh, with, uh, with, with small angle scattering or with any of the other scattering techniques. We have to go through some, some math and we can only go this way here, so we can only go the other way where we say, okay, I now assume that my molecule looks like, for example, this here. Then I have to do a develop a mathematical model for this. This is what I've illustrated down here. Then I have to take into account that I cannot measure an amplitude, I can only measure intensity, so I have to take the square of the whole thing. This is what is illustrated here. Then I also have to take into account that if I have 10 to the 16th of these molecules in my test tube, then they'll have all sorts of different orientations. So I also have to build that into my model. And this is what I've illustrated with these brackets here. And, uh, and then I can calculate what my scattering pattern would look like here. But this is unfortunately both a so-called inverse and a nonlinear, and therefore a quite complex problem. So, uh, so if I have to be honest, and tell you what I really do most of the time when I'm at work, then it's actually something like this here. So uh, the secret weapon that we really have as physicists, and I, I hope that you cannot read the equations here, so at least I'll not go through them. The secret weapon that we have as physicists that we really rely, rely heavily on um, through all our science is that we are really, really good at setting up these equations and programming it and have the computers work hard to crack our structures for us. This slide here is from one of my former PhD students, Nicolas, and uh, he, actually, he actually tried to make a really communication-friendly uh, slide <laughs> to illustrate <laughs> what it really is that we are doing. And I know he's, uh, he's very nice and a slightly nerdy physicist, so <laughs> <laughs> this is what communication looks like when you're a first-year PhD student. He, he, he graduated and he has had a nice career afterwards. So. Uh, so, so what can we use this technique for? Now I'm back to one of the applications here, and, and, and here I'll also reveal one of the big secrets, not a secret, but one of the big uh, things, the core businesses of, of one of the large companies that we have here in Denmark. So if you have a protein-based drug uh, that I talked about earlier, and that could, for example, be an insulin hexamere, 
Then when you have to inject it, so normally uh, with proteins you're used to looking at uh, these uh, declarations of food and you can see that the food maybe contains, I don't know, 5% proteins and so on. But those proteins you just eat and then they are digested in your stomach, uh, kick, uh, uh, cut up into amino acids and then those amino acids go out in your body and you use them to build new things from. So that's just building blocks for new things. But if you really want insulin and you eat it, then, uh, then you'll not get much out of it. So in order to get any effect out of insulin, you have to inject it subcutaneously, so, so right under the skin, uh, from a water-based solution. If you're a drug-producing company that wants to sell insulin, you normally have to be able to prove that you can, that you can put this, these molecules, a lot of these molecules, into a vial, and then the customer can place them, or the pharmacy can place them on a shelf for up to two years, and maybe in a third world, uh, third world country where they don't, where the fridge breaks down now and then, and so on. So you have to be safe after two years also. That's a challenge. And then, uh, then the heart bit comes, because then when you inject the insulin, you would also like to control how fast it works. Because if you're a diabetic pa patient, it's not very nice if you have to go and inject all the time. So it would be nice if you only had to inject uh, maybe once, once per day or once per week, week or something like this. So that's why uh, uh, the big drug producing companies, they put a lot of research into controlling what is uh, called the release profile. So when you inject the drug, then how fast does it distribute itself? And the original types of insulin they are sort of medium-releasing drugs, and that's basically the hexamers that I also showed you up here. And in order for this to work, you inject it as a hexamere, and then the hexamere wanders out in the body, and uh, then it falls apart into dimers, which are these green ovals here, and then they, these have to break up into monomers, and then the, then the insulin cascade cas can start. So this uh, slightly released, uh, uh, slightly uh, decayed uh, release here, Delayed release, sorry. If you want a fast release, not surprising, you surface modify the molecule here slightly so that it doesn't like to produce these hexamers any longer, but instead it enters your body as dimers, and then these dimers only have to fall apart into monomers, then they work. And then if you want to have a slow-releasing molecule, then you, uh, then you can put some, basically some glue on the outside, some molecular glue probably, that sounds more cool. But anyway, something that makes the insulin stick to each other. And then they form these large complexes of hexameric insulin, which is basically some nano-sized depots that forms right under your skin when you inject it. Then these hexamers have to fall off first, and then the he hexamers again have to fall apart into dimers, which then have to break up into monomers, and then you have the effect of the insulin. So that's a slow release, and if you can inject a large depot of this under your skin, then you don't have to inject insulin so, so often. So, uh, so for, if you're a company that produces these kind of things, then it's quite essential to, to con understand and control how such a protein can both be stabilized for storage, but also how it behaves when injected. And uh, if, if, you can, if you can do this, then you are in for really, really big business here. I think it's, it's a billion dollar industry to be able to control this. So if you can design some molecular glue that can control this and secure that it's released smoothly, then you don't have to do much more in your life, I think. <laughs> we tried in our own <laughs> humble approach to investigate some of the, to, to you know, find out what what the secret of some of the uh, molecules from Nomo Nordisk was. And, uh, and we took some, uh, and here you have some real small angle scattering data that I have measured myself, actually. Uh, so it's insulin. There was varying amounts of glue in the molecules. There was also varying amounts of salt in the molecules. So there's two series of data. There's one where we had 30 millimolar salt. And this is basically the amount of salt that we have in the vials before injection and then one where we have 150 millimolar salt, and this is the salinity, the salt concentration that we have in the blood. And you can see when we look at the molecules uh, in, in the vials, then they are actually hexameric or dihexameric, so they're quite small, which is nice if you want to keep them stable, then it's good that it's always dangerous if you have something that's too big, then it also wants to form something that's even bigger and so on. But this was actually quite small, you could see that they change from being hexameric to dihexameric as we put more, more glue on them. But then when we change the salt concentration to the levels in blood, then we could see that still if we have no glue on, they would still be hexameres, but then they would form these long rods, which actually is the same principle that also is used in the most modern types of, of, uh, of uh, long-lasting insulin. That, that is uh, 
They form these long rods, and then these hexamers probably falls off from the ends, and then off to these hexamers, and then the release starts. So, so that is actually, we could directly see that uh, from the small angle scattering. Of course, we could not uh, tell uh, Novo Nordisk much new here. They kind of already knew <laughs> this, or something like this. So, uh, so we have to dig a little bit deeper into that. But what would we like to, when we get ESS and MAX4, because this we could already do with existing facilities, is what would we like to be able to do much better in the future? There are many, many questions that we would uh, like to, to investigate with ESS and MAX4. But one thing is that, uh, general thing is that we would like to obtain a better understanding of nanoscale structures in biology. I told you and explained this insulin cascade, which is crucial for life. Uh, to you before, we want to find out what it really, I mean, this is just a drawing, and many of the things we know, many of the things we don't know, we would actually like to see whether it really looks like this. Um, another a great example is this so-called G-protein coupled receptor, which is a really important drug target, uh, where the structure of this was determined a few years ago. This also gave, gave a Nobel Prize to the, to, the, to the scientists behind it. It's quite important to know what these molecules look like because membrane proteins, they are the molecular target for about half of all medicine. And, and the big problem is, of course, that the membrane proteins, they're really small. They're only about 50 angstroms or 5 nanometers. And then they sit in this membrane, and they like to change conformation and so on. And, uh, and uh, it's actually extremely difficult to study while they sit in the membrane and while they, do, while they do their job. So that means that we know extremely little about membrane proteins. And it also means that all the modern methods we have for developing new drugs, they're basically based on trial and error uh, rather than intelligence, I would say. When, uh, when the big uh, pharmaceutical companies, they don't like the word trial and error because it sounds like they don't really know what they're doing. So they say that they use high throughput methods and so on. But high throughput methods is just another way of doing a lot of high trial and error in, in parallel. So this is actually the way that they go about now. It could be nice if, if we could actually understand some of those molecules better, then we would probably also be able to do more intelligent uh, development of new drugs. Uh, and then my, my personal grand goal is because now, I mean, it's nice to know what they look like on a picture of this. Actually, I would really like to find out what they look like when they function. So when the molecule comes and binds, they change conformation and so on. How can we see that? So I would really like to be able to obtain a molecular movie of, uh, of biological molecules in action. I think that's one thing that will probably keep me occupied the rest of my career. It's not particularly easy, unfortunately. So all this, we hope, all these answers, we hope that we'll be able to, to probably not close an answer, but start to address with ESS and, and MAX4 and some of the other nice facilities that are coming up. But in, in the beginning and in the next many years, at least when they come up, these will be the big facilities and will really be the best in the world. So I think in five to 10 years, I will not go so much to Grenoble any longer, but I'll go a whole lot to, to Sweden and hopefully get a lot of beam time there. So. Um, and then I'll end by asking the question, now I have told you a lot about medical molecules and biological molecules, and I come from a physics institute, so it's all this physicist, and what do I tell my, the people that employ me and so on. But I say that, yes, I think it's physics, because we heavily rely on methods from physics to investigate the molecules. And also, uh, I think, just like Hevesy, I think we are much more interested in finding out how to solve a problem than actually in using it for a whole range of, of biological problems. So as physicists, we like to think of ourselves a, a little bit as, as pioneers. We try to move out in a new area, uh, find out uh, now we can do this and that and so on. And then when we have done it two or three times, then we don't need to do more experiments there. Then we like to, to go somewhere else. But then hopefully some of the most important results, they will be picked up by biologists and engineers and so on and be used for to investigate a broad range of different molecules. Hevesy did very much the same. He developed a technique, used it a few times, then went on to something else. I think we will, I will do exactly the same as physicists. That's kind of encoded in our heads. Uh, but but uh, as physicists, uh, we depend very strongly on collaborations with bio biologists and 
medical doctors in order to address these questions and in particular to secure that it's the relevant questions that we ask and not just a nice question that we can solve with uh, some big toys in Sweden, but that we can actually help contributing to, to, to society and, and give back uh, from, uh, from what we have received. So concluding remarks, I hope that I have convinced you that many problems of biological or medical character they actually need methods from physics and, and also physicists to, to be solved. Um, then also, for all future science, it's essential with interdisciplinary uh, collaborations. There are few, I think if you're really a hardcore theoretical physicist, then you'll probably mostly talk to other physicists. But, uh, but many of us that uh, investigate sam <laughs> real samples from the real world and so on, we are, we are really highly dependent on being able to collaborate with, for example, with bio biologists in order to produce our samples and in order to, to ask the right questions. And then I also hope that I have convinced you that there are some really, really interesting perspectives with, uh, with ESS and MAX4 coming up in the neighborhood. I think a big, a large fraction of the physicists that we now train at the Niels Bohr Institute, they will probably end up in some relation with those two facilities. And I, I hope that, uh, that that'll also count for many others. So with this, I would like to thank you all for the attention here. It's been nice to have you all sitting here. So thank you.